Now, the next cause of cardiac chest pain is pericarditis. Now, pericarditis is a, a pain that occurs because the lining, the outside lining of the heart is inflamed. So the heart sits in a sac called the pericardium. And so this pink thing that I just drew right now is um, a representation of the pericardium. The pericardial sac helps lubricate uh, the surrounding tissue so you're not having friction um, between the heart and the lungs because uh, that can cause some pretty severe inflammation. And so the pericardium is that is that lining between the heart and the lungs. Now, pericarditis happens when you have inflammation of the pericardium itself. A lot of times it's due to, um, th- when we usually see it, it's, it's usually because the patient had a viral illness prior to that and it causes inflammation of that sac. Other things that can cause inflammation of the sac include uh, bacterial infections, and the, you can have cancer that can invade into the pericardium causing inflammation, autoimmune disorders can too, and, and autoimmune disorders are when your own, bo- your own body's antibodies attack itself. And so all of these things that cause inflammation of this lining will cause pericarditis. So what are the symptoms of pericarditis? Well, it's going to cause chest pain, and the pain can sometimes radiate to the trapezius muscles, which are the muscles of the shoulder. Um, the pain will increase as you breathe. So if you think about it, as you breathe, your your lung tissue is going to be right against the heart. And so as you breathe in and out, the lungs are going to expand, causing movement between the lungs and the pericardium. And so if this pericardium is inflamed and angry, every time you're breathing, you're just grating away at that pericardium, causing more inflammation and causing pain. And that that is why you have um, pain with inspiration. Now, if you think of... Um, if you think of uh, the pain decreasing with leaning forward, well, that, that in a way can make sense because as you lean forward, gravity is going gonna, is gonna to pull the, the heart away from the lungs. And so as you, um, the, the contact is not going to be as direct between the lungs and the pericardium. So what would you typically see on a physical exam? Well, you will typically hear something called a friction rub. Now, the friction rub kind of sounds like sandpaper. It, it's, it's a scratchy type sound, and I would encourage you all to just YouTube friction rub, and the first video is actually pretty good. Um, the other thing is you will see the patient um, grimacing in pain whenever they take a deep breath. And so those are all signs of uh, uh, pericarditis. Now, the studies that we usually get are pretty similar to um, the angina and myocardial infarction. Namely, you're going to get an EKG, um, and on the EKG, you're going to see diffuse ST segment elevations. That is similar to what you would see in angina and, uh, or not in angina, sorry, in a myocardial infarction, but in an infarction, it's specific to a specific territory of the heart versus in, in uh, pericarditis, you will see all of the different leads of the EKG having a ST segment elevations. And I will go over S, uh, go over EKGs with you, and this will make a little bit more sense then. And lastly, we, we tend to get an echocardiogram. Now, the echocardiogram is an ultrasound of the heart. It shows us in pretty good detail the different chambers of the heart. It shows us the pericardium itself if it's inflamed. And what we're looking for in uh, patients with pericarditis is a pericardial effusion. And what an infusion, effusion is, is basically just a collection of fluid. And so between the, the pericardial sac and the heart muscle itself, the myocardium, um, there's going to be a little bit of fluid here um, that can start to build up. Now, if that fluid builds up rapidly, you can have something called cardiac tamponade, where there's so much pressure between the sac and between the heart itself that the heart is no longer able to beat because the pressure inside the in inside the sac is more than the heart can overcome, and so um, you can have a failure of the heart, which is essentially a pump because the pressure outside is more than the pressure that the heart can generate, um, and so. Um, the, the echocardiogram is very important to see if, what the extent of a potential flu- effusion is and to see if you need to stick a needle in there and try to drain that effusion. And for uh, pericarditis, if you were to get a chest x-ray, a lot of times you won't see anything 
unless you have um, a, a tamponade situation. And with tamponade, if the the normal heart borders like that, with tamponade you'll have this water bottle type um, picture of the heart. And that's because the fluid um, around the, the heart and inside the pericardium is, is causing this um, that that balloon-like structure. But for the most part, you won't really see anything on x-ray. And lastly, we have aortic dissection. Now, aortic dissection is what it sounds like. So your aorta is the vessel that connects um, your heart to the rest of the body. All the blood is flowing through the aorta to supply your body with uh, blood. And so as blood leaves the heart, it travels down the aorta and it can travel up this way to the head and neck. Um, what happens with aortic dissection is this layer right here of vessel, uh, of your, your aortic vessel, can get disrupted and you start to create a, a pouch or a opening that that blood can seep into. And so as blood starts to seep into that opening, you, you dissect the layers of that vessel going down. Now, this is a pretty exaggerated representation of what an aortic dissection might look like. So if this is your aorta here, the blood usually travels down and it go goes to the rest of your body and perfuses your tissues. But with an aortic dissection, you now have this opening here that is now allowing for blood to flow into this area. Now, this is a false lumen. It's not an actual vessel. It doesn't go anywhere. Um, it, and it's just basically a pouch. But as as you start spilling blood into this area and the pressure increases, well, you're going to just keep dissecting down. And as you keep dissecting down, you can you can um, injure some of the vessels lower down that supply your kidneys, that supply your stomach, that supply basically everything because all of your blood flow going down is... Um, your aorta supplies all the blood flow going down and supplies the rest of your body. Now, the main danger with an aortic dissection is this lining here. This lining on the outside of the aortic dissection is very thin. It's not like the strong um, vessel lining uh, that is not dissected. And so if you're having a very high pressure in the aorta, which you do because it's such a high caliber vessel, well, you're, this very thin lining is now seeing high pressure and it's not going to be able to support that. So the big danger is that that vessel is going to rupture. And if that vessel ruptures, your entire blood supply is going to be spilling into a cavity it has no business being in. And so in an, in an aortic dissection that ruptures, depending on the cavity, you're going to have different complications, but the end result is the same, that your blood supply is going to an area it's not supposed to. It's going outside of your vessels. And because it's outside of your vessels, it no longer is able to supply the rest of your body. So what are the symptoms of an aortic dissection? Well, you're going to have a sudden ripping or tearing type pain that radiates to your back. And the, the reason why it radiates to the back area is because the aorta, as it travels away from the heart, it travels down uh, right above your spinal column. So um, that, that sudden ripping and tearing pain, you're going to feel it in, in your chest, but it, it usually radiates to the back. Your vitals um, will be variable, but for the most part, if it's bad enough, you can have a decrease in blood pressure. And as your, your heart starts to compensate and tries to push out more blood to perfuse the rest of your body, your heart rate will go up as well. So with people that we suspect to have an aortic dissection, we're able to usually distinguish it with the typical triad, which is just a fancy word of saying a series of three. So with this triad, what we usually see is abrupt pain, so it's going to be that ripping, tearing pain that radiates to the back, pulse or blood pressure differences. So the pulse difference is important because as you dissect sometimes, you dissect into these vessels that branch out first. These vessels here travel to the left and right arms. So if you test the, um, and, and to, the, to the head and neck. So if you're testing the pulses between the arms um, and the, the carotids and the, and the neck, and they are different, then that means you're probably dissecting higher up and you're disrupting these vessels going out. And then the last one is a widened mediastinum. So the mediastinum is a portion of the chest cavity where the vessels of the heart all exit and the, um, and you, you have the, the trachea coming down, the esophagus coming down. So it's that, it's, it's everything as the heart exits and everything coming down, that middle portion of the, um, of the thorax. And I'll show you um, an example of it when we go over the radiology portion. But on the chest x-ray, that mediastinum will be wide. And that makes sense because this normal, um, 
this normal uh, width of the aorta is now disrupted and you have extra um, extra space in here because the fluid is flowing in here. So when the mediastinum was usually this wide, now it's this wide. So that's, that's why we have that wide in mediastinum. So the studies that you usually get for uh, patients that you suspect to have an aortic dissection are pretty much the same as compared to the other, um, the other cardiac causes of chest pain. So you can get the chest x-ray, you're going to see that widened wide mediastinum. Um, the EKG is usually going to be normal. Um, you usually don't have a disruption of electrical activity. Um, and it makes sense because the, the process of what's going on is outside of the heart. And the troponin is usually negative because you're not having actual cardiac tissue um, injury. Again, it's everything is happening, out, happening outside of the heart. And so I hope this helps um, give you a general sense of um, some of the more common causes of cardiac chest pain. Um, in the next videos, we're going to go over um, the lungs. So we're going to talk about things within the lungs that can cause uh, chest pain. And um, aside from the lungs, there's also GI issues and uh, musculoskeletal issues as well. Um, and then we're going to talk about a little bit of anxiety that can um, cause some uh, chest pain. So um, if you have any feedback for this, uh, the way that this lecture was laid out, please let me know and please subscribe and um, like so that we can continue supporting this program. And I look forward to working with all of you guys this weekend.